And welcome back to our cozy space here. Um, last time we spoke about the breakdown of Polish-Jewish alliance, which had lasted really from mid-century, mid-19th century, uh, and it really picked up steam in the 70s and 80s as all the young Jews are coming through, the, the modernizing Jews are coming through the Polish system. But then it begins to crack in the 1890s, especially with the rise of Jewish nationalism. And most obviously we saw with this Zionist Ruthenian electoral alliance that was forged in 1907 and lasts for four years until 1911. And by the way, specifically the anti-Russian National Democrats. These Ruthenians are like the Jews trying to figure out what or who the hell they are uh, and what identity they, they ascribe themselves to, and this broader Ukrainian identity of the National Democrats is picking up steam at this point, national populism of sorts. Only now, in the late 1890s, 1900s, is it really beginning to have the upper hand against the Russophiles, those who suggested the Ruthenians were just some kind of little Russian people connected to the Russian people. The rise of Jewish national consciousness was uh, quite widespread by the eve of the war, but not much earlier than that. The very last 10 years or so of the, of the empire is where you see national consciousness, Jewish national consciousness quite widespread. But the elite Jews are still quite Polonized, much more so than even other parts of, uh, of Poland. Uh, and recall that the whole identity thing anyway is really quite complicated. There's a great line from uh, Vien Vienna's chief rabbi, Moritz Gudemann, who said the following about Viennese Zionists. Who is more assimilated, the nationally minded Jew who ignores the Sabbath or the observant Jew who feels himself to be a German, or in our case, who feels himself to be a Pole. These questions of identity and authenticity are at the heart of these, of these uh, debates and these fights between these, between these political factions, because politics in the end is connected very much to religion, which is connected to identity. And we'll see more uh, on that crack in the relationship between Poles and Jews when we talk about anti-Semitism later today, and especially the, the, the rise of a new Polish national movement. Um, we also spoke about the polish ruthenian conflict, which basically is the defining political issue of the last half century of Galician life, especially around the elections and especially beginning in 1897 when uh, Austria added a fifth curia to parliamentary elections, which was open to every adult male. And now they had a lot fewer representation than the other curia, like the, the large landowners and so on, but it meant that every adult male could vote and that raised the stakes uh, and the nature of elections uh, very, very much, especially in 1907 when it was equalized and every adult male vote was more or less worth the same. Today we're going to shift gears. We're still in the second half of the 19th century. We're still deeply in Galicia and we're going to talk about economics and anti-Semitism and why those things are connected, uh, but also Jewish life more broadly in the 19th century. More social history today rather than political history, and you see the outline, as I always give you, that we're going to go through. We'll talk about the economic profile of the Jews in the 19th century, in the second half of the 19th century, about the rise of uh, Galician poverty and what that means, emigration from Galicia a little bit, and also anti-Semitism. And finally, at the end, we'll talk a little bit about religious and educational life uh, as part of our profile of the second half of the 19th century in Galicia. And you know, there's a reason why economics and anti-Semitism belong together in Galicia. There is a high degree of congruence between nationality and the socioeconomic position. Poles were gentry, and in West Galicia also there were Polish-speaking peasants. They didn't yet have a Polish national identity, but they were Polish-speaking, and they were moving towards that national identity toward the end of the 19th century. Ukrainians or Ruthenians uh, were overwhelmingly East Galician peasants, although, though, although though there was a thin stratum of intelligentsia, virtually all of them priests, which is quite typical of a peasant society. Jews were diverse, but overwhelmingly served as intermediaries between lord and serf, so to speak, right, in this, in this feudal economy. And they also took important positions in the money economy as that began to emerge in the second half of the 19th century. There are a number of causes of this new anti-Semitism, but the poverty and the congruence of ethnicity and economic function will play a key role. So let's take a look at the economic profile of the Jews. Here's the population numbers, in case you forgot them, and also the density, where the Jews are living the most, more in East Galicia than the West, and the population growing quite quickly, although their numbers as a percentage, as you can see, is declining ever so slightly every 10 years that passes. In 1910, over two-thirds of Galician Jewry were still involved in trade, handcraft, and small industry. 37% of Jews alone are in trade. That constitutes about 87% of the trade workforce in Galicia in 1900, the rest being mostly Polish. 
They had virtually no serious competitor until the end of the century. Ukrainians were peasants and urban Poles dominated the public service, everything from the top administrative positions down to the city janitors. Uh, in industry, about a quarter of Jews are working in industry. That's about 36% of the Galician industrial workforce, but not any industry, specific industries. Um, for example, there are several branches of production that were almost entirely in Jewish hands. Flour mills, uh, alcohol above all, small oil refineries, and we'll mention more about that in a couple minutes in Drobich and Borisov, these new oil refineries that are being discovered. Uh, saw mills, tanneries, brickyards, soda water factories, Match factories are almost exclusively hiring Jews, um, and also plants producing uh, Jewish prayer shawls, talisim. And I want to remind you, we talked about this in Kolomea, there were these talis factory uh, strikes that happened, or strike I should say, in 1892 that received a lot of attention that we talked about uh, last time. Jews were especially well represented in the liquor trade, and they dominated in cattle, horses, poultry, and feathers. Uh, these are agricultural trades, but Jews are in the, those regions doing this. They also dominate textiles and food industry, uh, and not dominate, but are quite well represented in leather, paper, chemical, and printing industries. Uh, most Jewish enterprises are small, family-oriented, and uh, rather weak, uh, hiring at most a few people. Most Jewish workers are, are working in these small shops with, with very poor working conditions and very, very low wages. Uh, and by the way, this profile, as an aside, make Jews particularly sensitive to government intimidation during elections. A lot of segments of Jewish society, uh, merchants, shopkeepers, innkeepers, and artisans, and so on, they're dependent on the magistrate and the state bank and the police and other state and city institutions, and they really couldn't risk the retribution of those forces if they voted against the candidate that was being pushed on them by the conservative Polish Jewish Alliance. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but this is brings me to the issue of oil. So Drohobich. Drohobich had been transformed in the mid-19th century by the discovery of oil in nearby Borisov and by new methods of its refinement to turn it into something useful. By the early 1900s, uh, Galicia had become the third largest producer of oil in the world after Russia and the United States. And the new oil industry uh, in which Jews played a leading role as both developers and workers turned Drobich into a much more prosperous and cosmopolitan city than most other Galician Jewish communities. Uh, hence, we mentioned already the Zionist artist E.M. Lillian and looked at some of his work. We talked about him another time, but also uh, before him, Maurizio Gottlieb, and after him, Bruno Schultz. Uh, here is on the left, you see Bruno Schultz, the famous uh, writer and artist from Drobich who was murdered during the Holocaust in a, in a very well-known story for those who know his biography. And on the right, you see one of the most famous paintings of Moritzi Gottlieb, uh, of, of Jews praying Yom Kippur, and that's, of course, him standing in the center. He died quite young. Um, the, Drobich was actually the third wealthiest city in Galicia, and it serves as the living quarters of the wealthy Jews who owned, who owned the oil fields in Borisov and the surrounding area. Uh, the Gartenberg family, for example, with its most important uh, member in the early 1900s being Jakob Forstein, whose picture's there, and the difference between Jakob Forstein sitting in Vienna, uh, sorry, sitting in Drohobich and owning all those oil fields, and the workers who are uh, dragging the buckets is pretty clear. These elite Jews generously funded the Jewish community, which I'll talk about at the end of class, but they also controlled them quite tightly. And over the years, we'll see Jewish workers being squeezed out of the, of the workforce, replaced by Ruthenians, although Jews remain uh, important until about 1900. After, in, 19, in 1897, still two-thirds, about 6,000 of the 9,000 workers in the oil business, in the oil fields were Jewish, but that soon declined quite, quite, quite precipitously. But they remain important among the owners of the fields, and this is really a great example of, of, of a point I want to make, that we don't want to overstate the ethnic conflict between Poles and Jews. I'm about to go on and talk about anti-Semitism and, and, and pogroms even and the new Polish nationalism. But even as we move towards World War I, the end of Galicia, we don't want to overstate the ethnic conflict. Uh, in Drobich, as in all over Galicia, the Jewish economic elites united with conservative Polish politicians to dominate local politics. And we know that ethnic divisions between Catholic Poles and Jews were often far less important than the separation of the socioeconomic elites, Jews and Poles, from the masses. Uh, you know, 
the way that these elites control the elections, is, it's called Galicia Valen, Galician elections. It's a little bit akin to what in America we call Chicago elections, with the same jokes uh, about the dead coming to vote uh, and so on. They would say, uh, you know, Kohanim, Jewish priests, they shouldn't go vote because the dead are there and it's, you know, the Kohanim are not allowed to be near the dead and that kind of thing. Uh, this is something that's close to my heart. In 1911, uh, there was a massacre. It was called the Bloody Elections of 1911. And uh, essentially, an alliance of Jews, Ukrainians, and Poles, led by Zionists and socialists, uh, were trying to fight back against these Galician elections, which were being corrupted uh, for the socioeconomic el elite, led by Jakob Forstein and his Polish allies. And the army un uh, fired and killed 26 people. Eventually, 40 died. It was quite a scandal. It was uh, heard around. It was shots heard around the world. I, I've seen coverage of this event in Australia and in all over the United States and all over Europe and of course all over Austria and so on. But it really, for me, is important to remember that again, you see that despite all the tensions, this is 1911, the very end of Galicia. Often, it's the socioeconomic links that are more important than the ethnic ones. Um, we see the same thing with socialist parties. There's research being done now that suggests that the Jews, Ukrainians, and Poles, who all had their own socialist parties at the end of Galicia, that they were coordinating their efforts, for example, in their May Day paid routes, much more than people thought in the past. There's also a growing professional class among the Galician Jewish elite. In 1910, there are 48,000 Jews in free professions. Jews constitute 30.9% of lawyers already in 1887, 48.3% in 1897, and 58% of the lawyers by 1910. 58%. Likewise, doctors, 26.2% in 1887, up to 29.9% in 1910. Uh, Jewish civil servants, much lower because of discrimination, but a lot of Jewish white collar workers found work in private companies, banking, and in Jewish industries. All of that, trade and, and certain industries and so on, all of that is in contrast to the agricultural sector. In 1910, still only 10% of Jews worked in agriculture in a province in which over 80% of the people were working in agriculture, about 72% of the Poles and over 90% of the Ruthenians. Jews constituted just 2% of the population working in agriculture, even though they were 11% of the population as a whole. Uh, now, it is worth noting, though, because of their emancipation, Jews could now purchase estates. They could purchase land. And by World War I, Jews constituted 22% of the landowners in Galicia. That's a higher percentage than anywhere else in Europe. On average, their holdings were smaller than, than most, but uh, they do hold 20% of the large estates as well. All in all, Jews have about 16% of the, of the private land of Galicia, which is quite incredible if you think about it for a moment. Now, this is a small number, a small percentage of the Jewish population as a whole, but it still nevertheless made a, quite an impact. Uh, many of the most important Polonized Jewish elites, who were originally doc doctors and lawyers and other professionals, they also bought land and thereafter became quite, af quite active in politics as landowners. So Nathan Lubinstein, for example, that's his picture right now on your left of your screen, he was the candidate who Jakob Forstein was pushing on Drobich in both 1907 and 1911. Uh, he and Heinrich Kolischer and Samuel Horwitz and other leaders of the Polish Jewish Electoral Committee, this committee of elite Jews working with conservative Poles to win office to parliament, uh, they're all professionals buying land, grounding themselves in Galicia, you know, almost quite literally. And some Polish thinkers actually applaud this. They like this grounding of the Jews in Galicia, but many, of course, in the context of rising anti-Semitism, uh, strongly opposed and feared it. Let's talk about poverty for a little bit. Uh, Galician Jews had a much easier path to emancipation than elsewhere in Eastern Europe, but their poverty was much, much worse. Uh, there was a miserable economic situation of the province in general. It remained largely rural and impoverished really all the way till 1914 and, and, and beyond. Austria deliberately left Galicia undeveloped without even a significant rail line until quite late. And even after Polish autonomy uh, in 67, 68, there was little economic growth at all until the very late 1880s and 1890s. In all uh, of Europe, west of Russia, only Ireland was less urbanized. Consumption of grain, of meat, and potatoes was half that of the West European average. Uh, 55,000 people starved to death annually out of a population of about 10 million. That's about half a percent a year, something the equivalent of, do I tell my students in the United States, something like one and a half million Americans starving to death every year. Now, agriculture remained quite concentrated in fewer hands, uh, more so than in any land, any other land of the former Polish 
Commonwealth. 40% of Galician land was held in estates of more than 50 hectares, while 71% of peasants in 1902 held estates of less estates, held land holdings of less than five hectares. 40% of the peasants held less than two. Two, the population as a result had very low purchasing power and the province remained mired in feudal relationships with very few industrial developments. And that, that was developed, was run by nobles for their own benefit. So for example, a third of the industry that did exist was developed by landowners to, for you know, beer breweries, distilleries, and mills. These are things designed just to extract the wealth off their land. Um, early capitalism would, as we'll see, destroy the Jewish economy. But even before capitalism begins to set in in the 80s and 90s, that Jewish economy was collapsing because there were simply far too many people working in petty trade and industries and the economy could sustain. Uh, in the late 80s and 90s, some growth does begin to happen and Jews take advantage of it to a certain extent, uh, especially Jews getting involved in agriculture as we've talked about. But once the railroad finally, finally comes, that's going to be devastating. It's going to cut into the business of Jewish shopkeepers in small towns, for example. Uh, the growth of modern forms of business concentrated in cities will reduce the economic opportunities of many Jewish middlemen and brokers. You know, this, the process is going to bring consumers to the larger city, reduces the economic importance of the fairs and the market days in the small towns. That kills the livelihood of thousands of Jewish families who are doing that middleman job. It likely also kind of uh, screws the small Jewish artisans, right, like tailors, uh, because landed gentry now had their clothes made in larger cities. And meanwhile, Austrian firms could flood the market with cheap, ready-made clothes for everybody else. Same with shoe manufacturers and furniture makers and other small artisans. The railroad also undermines the need for large numbers of Jewish coachmen and drivers, which had been a major part of the Jewish economy. Meanwhile, the development of modern banking does away with private money lending. And this had grown especially important among village shopkeepers following the emancipation of the serfs, because the serfs have these small land holdings now. They have very little or, any, or no liquid capital. So they're buying on credit, which is effectively a form of loans, or they're going to the innkeepers as a loan source. By 1901, these are, this is going to be, uh, besides the, the modern banking system, there's going to be a uh, loan association set up to, again, cut out the Jewish, uh, the Jewish agent, 720 of them by 1901. That's also going to undermine this, this part of the Jewish economy. And then things are going to be made even worse by anti-Jewish discrimination by the ruling Poles in state administration. We already mentioned how very few Jews managed to enter the civil service. And especially it will be made worse by the rise of Polish and Ukrainian cooperative movement, which is designed specifically to eliminate the role of the Jewish middlemen. First, the Polish farm cooperative in 1885, and then 1888, the Ukrainian. And these were originally agricultural cooperatives, but they grow to include commercial ventures as well as and, and, and they, they, they successfully dislodged many Jews in areas where they had been dominant. There were 607 county stores by 1890, 1,220 by 1896. And they're selling goods and agricultural tools. They're buying products back from the peasants. They're eliminating the need for Jewish country shopkeepers and village peddlers or for Jewish grain and cattle dealers. And that was deliberate. It was deliberate. And it wasn't, uh, as they say in Hebrew, it wasn't necessarily the hachis. It wasn't necessarily despite the Jews, it was actually in helping themselves and helping their own economy, but the Jews are the victim of that process. And they're not totally effective, obviously, but they're going to be supported by the, these efforts of the co-ops are going to be supported by the Polish administration in lots of ways. So, for example, in 1911, the Poles, uh, Polish uh, rulers enact a Sunday rest law, which is highly damaging to Jewish competitiveness for Jews who are still resting on Saturdays. Uh, they tried to create a Polish middle class by creating special license requirements, which they refused to give to Jews for jobs that traditionally were held in Jewish hands, like peddling, old clothes trading, transportation, uh, running an employment agency, owning pharmacies, and so on. The salt monopoly in particular was used to squeeze out Jews. Uh, government purchases or the government purchase orders would only or be, would be attempted to give only to Poles. Uh, likewise, a new veterinarian law limits Jewish participation in the cattle trade. Uh, and most uh, famously, if you read the press at the time, in 1910, Jews were forbidden to sell alcoholic beverages. They lost their access to what was called propanazia. It had been a noble privilege to, um, to lease the right of producing and selling alcohol, which nobles did uh, leased almost completely to Jews. 
a couple decades earlier, they sold this right to the state and then leased it back and then subleased it to the Jews. That was all coming apart now, and in 1910, the Jews were going to lose. The state was taking over completely, and they were going to lose their uh, niche selling alcohol. Now, alcohol, they, this was fought. They actually went to Vienna. There were mass rallies. The Zionists and other integrationists tried to get the government to back away from this because 70,000 Galician Jews were making a living on alcohol. That's almost 10% of the population. So it was going to have a devastating effect without, without a doubt. Uh, but on the other hand, it was also kind of awkward because of the cultural connection. Jews as innkeepers uh, poisoning the peasants effectively, selling them alcohol, keeping them drunk. Um, so it was awkward. Uh, it was difficult. But in any event, when it happened, and it did happen, it was devastating to the economy. Jews were thrown out of this industry by and large. Uh, these co-ops also launched nationalist anti-Semitic campaign with the slogan, Polonization of Trade. They started by boycotting surviving Jewish shopkeepers. This is backed by a Catholic convention in Krakow in 1893 that declares an anti-Jewish boycott lasts all the way till World War I. Now, all these things are happening specifically to the Galician Jewish population, but I want to point out for a moment that statistic I gave you earlier, that stat uh, 55,000 starving to death and some of the other stats at that time. This comes from a very oft-quoted source uh, by a guy named Stanislav Shepanovsky, uh, who wrote a book called The Misery of Galicia. This idea, this refrain, Galician misery, poverty, economic backwardness, that becomes by now, and it's, it's grounded in a, in a reality to be sure, but it becomes by now a part of the identity of the province in the last half century. Uh, what he does effectively, he moves this Josephinian notion of the backwards, brutal, half-Asian militia, and he moves it into the world of social science and popularizes it more thereby. Uh, the impoverishment of the Galician Jews in particular becomes a major topic of discussion in, in the parliament, actually, in general, but also in the international aid agencies, especially the Jewish aid agencies, right? And most importantly, the Baron Hirsch Fund. Uh, Baron Hirsch establishes an extensive network of primary and trade schools designed to train boys and girls for skilled careers. Uh, and I'll talk about that again at the end of, of the lecture. And there are other organizations, for example, working to combat white slavery. Uh, which was a real problem uh, in, uh, in Galicia. There's a new work that's coming out by Kitty Sedar Halstead, who's working on this, on this subject for quite a while. Uh, in short, to bring it all together, the early spread of capital growth in Galicia did a lot of harm and very little good for Galician Jews in the context of everything else that was happening. Insufficient industrial growth to absorb the new unemployed Jews, and those who do find work earn less than the non-Jews because those industries that Jews are in are oversaturated. Uh, in Senesuava, for example, about half of the Jews applied for charity help in 1897. And as a result, Jewish economic situation is getting worse and worse in the final decades before World War I. Uh, Jews are generally living under very difficult housing and health conditions. Jewish city neighborhoods are densely built over, often dirty and dark. Uh, their inhabitants are subsisting on an unhealthy diet, frequently suffering from various diseases, few paved roads. Uh, you know, people who are unaccustomed to city life in these neighborhoods describe being choked by the stench from open sewers and gutters and so on. Cholera epidemics threatened Galician villagers in 1873 and again 1894. And one result of this is obviously going to be emigration. Uh, one of the most important results of these miserable conditions, the very high rate of emigration by Galician Jews, higher even than of Russian Jewry. Now, that was true also of non-Jews coming out of Galicia. Non-Jews are, are leaving Galicia in disproportionately lower numbers compared to Jews from Galicia, but they're leaving in higher numbers than of the same national group leaving the Russian Empire. In other words, Poles in Galicia are leaving less than their number in Galicia, but higher than the Polish, Polish percentage of Russia. And that's one of several indications historians have that Jews are leaving Eastern Europe far more because of economic impulses than because of violent anti-Semitism. Uh, in other words, when Jews start fleeing Russia in the 1880s, it's pretty clear they're leaving uh, Galicia uh, because of economic misery. When they leave Russia, it's for the same reason. There's other evidence as well. Uh, I'll just mention one example uh, that if you look at internal migration in the Russian Empire, you see Jews moving from the north, where there were very few pogroms, but the economy was quite weak, to the south, where there are far more pogroms, but the economy was stronger. So there's evidence to suggest uh, 
you know, it's hard to get into the minds of two and a half, three million people, why they left, why they did what they did. You have memoirs and so on. But there is a sense, and part of the story is Galicia. The fact that Jews are leaving Galicia in such higher numbers, and the fact that other nationalities are also leaving Galicia in numbers higher than their Russian counterparts, this tells us something about what's pushing people out. And that keeps in mind, by the way, Galician Jews are emancipated. They're leaving in higher numbers despite being legally free. Again, tells us something about the, the need for economic sus, uh, sustainability. Between 1881 and 1910, 236,504 Jews, at my last count, left to America. About 30% of all the emigrants from Galicia, which means since they were 11% of the population, three times their percentage in the population. Um, even small Galician shtetls were well represented in the New World, establishing these so-called Landsmannschaften, right? These societies of people coming from the same, same city in Eastern Europe. They'd form a society together in the New World. Uh, not all of them to the United States. Many go, there's a South American contingency, and a lot of Galicians are connected to Canada, uh, which also attracts many, many Ukrainians. This picks up considerable speed in the 1890s, uh, over the 1880s, uh, because the economic situation is getting more dire. Uh, the numbers at least twice as many Jews left in the 1890s as left in the 1880s, maybe even three times. The numbers aren't 100% clear. Hundreds of thousands of Jews, besides those going to the New World, are moving either to Hungary in the mid to late 19th century or else to Vienna in the late 19th into the early 20th century. A lot of the famous Viennese Jews are coming from, you know, Sigmund Freud, for example, is coming from Galician parents who moved to Vienna. Uh, One-time Galician Jews actually made up about three-quarters of Hungarian Jewry by that time. And this leads us to the issue of political and violent anti-Semitism. Uh, clearly, anti-Semitism was on the rise. It didn't, you know, reach the heights that we saw across the border in Russia, but it was on the rise. And if, you know, even if the local government was discriminatory, you know, Jews were emancipated. Imperial law protected them to an extent. I mean, Galicia was relatively far away and conceptually far away. We saw in Drohovich in 1911, for example, there was this massacre uh, and people, you know, there was this, this sort of mock election that was just a, a total sham. And really, there was nothing the Jews could do. The local powers uh, had all, pulled all the strings. So they were emancipated, but local power meant something. But at the same time, something new is going on now. Political anti-Semitism is entering Galicia in the 1880s. This is something different. This is typically associated with Vienna and Berlin. This means uh, a type of anti-Semitism which is not based on theology, typically. It's based usually on secular ideas, often race, but not always. Uh, their idea of a political movement or political party that uses anti-Semitism as a cement to bring together classes of people who would not normally be together in a single political party, where anti-Semitism is the glue of that party and the crux of their worldview. This is uh, a movement coming out of, again, Berlin and Vienna above all else, beginning in the 70s into the 80s, and it finally begins to crash in the 90s, and it enters uh, Galicia at the same time in the 1880s. Uh, precisely now for the same reasons as there. Uh, emancipation means that Jewish political importance becomes quite uh, 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 profound, quite obvious, but even more so the new opportunity of tapping into the emancipated masses who can now vote, right? That means a lot, and that means growing anti-Semitism in public life. So, for example, in 1881, a delegate uh, in the SEM, in the Galician uh, Diet, denounces Jewish radicals, quote-unquote Jewish radicals in speeches. He's employing classic anti-Semitic accusations and arguing for specific measures needed to be taken uh, to reduce Jewish power in the province. Uh, for example, among other things, he wants to translate the Talmud to the Polish because of this old idea there's something in there that's sinister. We have to find out what these sinister Jews are actually talking about. Uh, he calls for the abolition of Jewish community councils. Uh, he publishes blatantly anti-Semitic pamphlets and a series of articles in Polish nationalist newspapers that again we see the vital importance of the almost uncensored press in Galicia, in this case the Polish press, so important for changing ideas and moving, moving masses. Uh, there was a growing discourse about Galician Jews as different, uh, as not native to the land, which ties into the discourse of race, even for those who don't believe in it. And this is key to a secularized as a opposed to a purely theological anti-Semitism. For example, there's an academic study in the late 70s uh, of the people of Galicia, and here's how it describes Jews. Quote, the population of this third nationality in Galicia, though not native, but immigrants, 
and of a completely uh, different breed becomes an interesting and scientifically important subject of research precisely on account of its own distinctiveness. For in spite of many centuries of existence in our country, this people living in villages and little towns, those we dealt with exclusively in our research, did not grow from the earth so as to be able to distinguish themselves by any stamp of the locality. Jews don't grow from the earth. This notion, a very anti-Semitic and romantic notion, that the peasants, the Polish peasants, the Ukrainian peasants, whatever it may be, are somehow from the earth. Their blood and sweat mixing in. They're coming up out of the earth itself. And the Jews are from some foreign planet who are placed there, but not of the earth. I mean, it's, it's obviously not very scientific, but in their mind, it, it really was. Um, incidentally, counter to this, there, were, there was, uh, you think about a guy like, and I just can't resist mentioning him now, Karl Emil Franzos. He was the one who really does more, this German, Jew, German Jewish writer from Galicia, Jewish writer from Galicia writing in German, who does the most to build this image of Galicianers and of Galicia itself. As he called it half Asia, half Asian. And he, and he focuses on the Jews as this barbaric half Asian people, but specifically as a part of the landscape as a part of the landscape, and not only him as a Jew, the great Ukrainian writer and nationalist intellectual Ivan Franco. Ivan Franco, like half of West Ukraine is named after him now. They named the whole, Suavov is now named after him. There are streets and universities and so on. Uh, the, one of the founders of the Ukrainian nationality. He likewise discusses a distinctly Galician type Jew. So, you know, yes, you have these rising anti-Semitic ideas, but it's not universal, and we'll see more of that uh, in a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Uh, there was also a blood libel in 1882. Blood libels, this medieval notion, uh, really medieval notion, uh, that Jews are uh, murdering Christians to use their blood for ritual purpose, such as uh, to baking in matzah, for example. There was an explosion of blood libel accusations in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, in, the eight, in, the, in the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the most famous is Mendel Bayliss in Russia, but there are m many of these. Hillel Kival is, is about to come out with uh, a major work going through the whole, the whole history of this period. Uh, in Galicia, there was a Jew and his wife who were accused of murdering a Christian girl and are sentenced to death by a jury in Krakow for having murdered her for ritual purposes, to use her blood. And after several appeals and retrials, they were finally acquitted in 1886 by the Supreme Court in Vienna. But of course, all the while, the case is feeding anti-Semitic discourse throughout this whole period. Uh, and uh, anti-Semitism appears most explosively in a series of pogroms in Western Galicia in 1898, when the so-called Russian problem of pogroms finally crosses over the border into the Austrian Empire, though maybe it's more helpful to think of Vienna and Berlin crossing the border into the empire because that's where these political anti-Semitic ideas really come from. Uh, the background is the rise of radical Polish nationalist parties uh, against the Polish conservatives, the Polish Peasant Party, the Christian People's Party, the Peasant Party Alliance. These groups are blaming rural poverty on Jewish oppression and the impact of the Jewish tavern. Again, with the tavern and the alcohol, but also the money lending. As Kival put it once, to a peasant, the fact that the innkeepers, moneylenders, and estate managers spoke Yiddish and were Jews amounted to little more than an obvious description of the world. But at this moment, this is, this is me speaking now, at this moment, with the stress from serf emancipation still in the wind, with incipient capitalism and poverty and so on, relationships were changing and Jews seemed now uh, much more hostile and threatening in that, in that role. And again, this is similar to the model of the Austrian German anti-Semitic parties, anti-Semitic agitation with, with sort of demagogic slogans are quite successful in this impoverished area, and especially because of the economic role of Jews as, as traders and tavern keepers. Uh, the most important of these figures is, is on the screen right now, Father Stoyovowski uh, of the Christian People's Party. He doesn't just call for boycotts. In 1898, in, uh, connected to the parliamentary election of a peasant seat, he organizes mobs of peasants who attack Jewish quarters in towns and villages across Western Galicia. Hundreds of shops are plundered and destroyed. Unlike Russia, there is no uh, lives lost, only property, and that's important. Uh, there is some religious and racial sentiment behind this, but above all, it was about economic resentment and the tensions of small town Poles with Jews. It was in the small towns more than anything else. Uh, when they later, these mobs later turned to noble estates and Christian homes, 
uh, troops that were then finally dispatched and suppressed the whole thing. A state of emergency was called in all 33 western districts of Galicia and the 33 west Galician districts. Several were put under martial law. Thousands of rioters were arrested. Dozens were killed. More than half of those thousands were convicted. And this is Austria, after all, right? Austria is going to eventually impose the rule of law and arrest and convict those who need to be. Uh, one of your articles for today focused on these riots and the meaning of them. So I'll leave it to Dan Donofsky to uh, tell you the rest about it. But I want to again note the critical role of the press, both as background to these feelings and as the immediate short-term instigation for the riots. You also have uh, to read Jampol Himka on the Ukrainians and the Ukrainian Jewish relationship in terms of this new anti Semitism. And also, you'll see in your final class an article uh, uh, that's not about the Holocaust only, but actually looks back on the relationship between Jews, Germans, and Ukrainians in East Galicia over 100, 200 years uh, to help us understand the Holocaust. So we'll, you can see more on the Ukrainian side with those articles. And I want to end my discussion of anti-Semitism with just one mention of the party, the Indec party, from Domovsky, uh, the Polish National Democratic Party, founded by this guy Domovsky in 1893 in Congress, Poland. Uh, this is a party that basically sees Jews as uh, unassimilatable, as this foreign toxic element. They have a Galician iteration. It's uh, arguably a little bit less overtly anti-Semitic than the Congress Poland iteration, uh, but it's quite important. And that's the direction of Polish nationalism. So when we understand the impact of Domofsky and the index, um, it's going to be very important for the interwar period when they really come to power, more so than maybe the Galician period. Uh, let's finally talk about religious and educational life just a little bit. And here we spoke about this somewhat when we spoke about Hasidism. So I'm going to return to a couple of those things and uh, just give us a little bit of an overview of the second half of the 19th century. Now, Galician Jewry in, in these years remains still a highly religious, mostly Hasidic community, all the way up to World War I and even beyond into the interwar period. The power of the rabbis, and especially the Hasidic rabbis, remained considerable. And some of the most important early Hasidic leaders were based in Galicia, most famously Elimelech of the Jensk, who gave us the whole theory of the, of the tzaddik almost single-handedly. Many of his most important disciples were based in Galicia. Um, and in our period now, the country was divided between various uh, rebbes, various tzaddiks. Uh, Chaim Halbostam establishes the dynasty of Novosans, of the Sans Hasidim, probably the most important of these. It was founded in 1830, and in our period was probably the most important of all the Hasidic groups in Galicia. Uh, Shalom Rokeach founds the Bells dynasty, which was important with Machzik Das, you might remember. Uh, Sadegor, uh, which is in Bukovina and Chernovitz, but right next door and connected to Galicia in a sense. The Rujin dynasty, right? So the Israel Rujin, the regal way, that's his court right there in Sadegor on your screen. Um, and he has all of these sons who establish courts in Chortkov, Siaden, and other dynasties as well in Galicia. Uh, in the second half of the 19th century, maybe six out of seven Galician Jews were Hasidim, which is really remarkable and worth keeping in mind. Some tzaddiks even begin to occupy rabbinic posts. And here I have for you a piece. Again, we come to um, Sacher Masak. We've come to him before. It's for the word masochism comes from because some of his more exciting stories. And he quotes in one of his works a visit to the court of Sadagor. And it's worth looking at because it gives us a sense of what it meant to go to the court of the Rebbe. And, you know, recall this notion of Galicia as half Asia, this barbaric place different from civilized German Europe. And he comes there and he describes it in exotic terms. It's, it's oriental, especially the women, right? I feel like I was transported to the harem of the Sultan in Constantinople. He's describing opulent wealth, furs and silk and so on, and vast numbers of petitioners coming to fund that wealth. But above all, he sees this as quintessentially Galician. In order to understand the Hasidic sect, he says, one has to understand this land where they live. One has to know Galicia. Think, he says, of a boundless plain covered with green sprouts in the spring, yellow fields of grain in the summer, and snow in the winter. You know that the sailor who spends his life in the middle of a watery desert becomes taciturn, serious, melancholy. The Galician flatlands produce the same effect. Here people have a feeling of infinity that they cannot grasp, and they withdraw unto themselves. And he describes mystics withdrawing unto themselves, drawing from their own tradition and longing and discovering, hearing God, imagining conversations with angels and demons. No, he says, the Hasidim are not swindlers. They are all Hamlet and Faust. And you shouldn't be surprised when they end up a little crazy like Hamlet. Uh, this is 
the, the part of the, of the topography of Galician Jewry in the 19th century. Um, the religious community is, is still uh, the most influential, important local institution besides the court of the Rebbe. Uh, prayers and religious customs, you know, fixed and weekly timetables, all this stuff, ways of dressing, eating. This is still, uh, the pulse of Jewish life is still set by these things. Work stops in a Galician shtetl on Friday night and shops remain closed on Saturday. And daily life returns slowly and cautiously to normal on Sunday because of the rest laws. Uh, the Kultus Gemeinde, the Israelitish Kultus Gemeinde, the, uh, the Jewish community, the law was reworked in 1890, which essentially, essentially establishes in every community a single uh, Religionsgemeinschaft, like a sort of a religious community. Every Jew has to belong to a religious community by law. The state is now supervising and protecting individual local communities. So, for example, uh, teachers of the Mosaic religion in the state schools receive permanent positions at schools and paid by state budgets. And these bodies were responsible for the entire religious life of the local Jewish population, slaughterhouses, ritual bath, birth, marriage, divorce, and death registries, the main synagogue, the Jewish hospital, and so on. And they controlled community tax income. They paid wages to the rabbi and the other community professionals. And again, these are constituted legal bodies endowed with public law status and privileges, with the right to tax their members and maintain objects and get anything connected with religious life. They are in constant financial trouble. A lot of their meetings are just about needing to be bailed out. And that's the wealthy few who step up, like Jakob Forstein, and bail out these groups and fund them. They obviously do so with tight control over their activities. Uh, education, the cheders, the traditional Jewish cheder with all of its uh, all, you know, faults and, and strengths, I suppose. Uh, the, the, this continues, absolutely dominant. Um, but progressive elements are increasingly attending secular schools. And interestingly, the daughters of Hasidic homes for a generation or two are attending Hasidic schools. And the reason for that is uh, a custom that develops because of the compulsory education law, but the fact that there were insufficient normalishul for all of the kids. So it became a Hasidic custom to send your daughters to the secular schools to fill the seats so that your sons would be exempt because there was no place for them and they could get the more important cheder education that they needed. This goes on for a generation or two, it becomes absolutely normative. And one result, of course, is this cultural conflict, this gap between the, the, the girls and the boys or the men and the women who are raised in these different environments. It's one of the reasons why the base Yaakov school system is founded in Galicia by a Galicianer in Krakow. It's not a coincidence that it's born in Krakow because she sees the founder of Beis Yaakov saw the result of these girls going to these public schools for all these years. In 1830, only 408 Jewish children attended the public schools in Galicia. By 1900, the number was 110,269. That's about 11.4% of all the students in the schools. In other words, Jews are attending commensurate, commensurate with their percentage of the population. Uh, this has implications in terms of Polonization. These are schools being taught in Polish, obviously, not in Yiddish or in Ukrainian. Um, Jews are also overrepresented, however, in higher education. So in 1906-7, 21% of secondary school students were Jewish, almost twice their population numbers. 25% of the University of Lemberg, 14% of the University of Krakow, and many others studied at the University of Vienna. Uh, this will help explain the disproportionate numbers of Jews in the professional class that we talked about earlier on. Uh, I mentioned earlier the, the Baron Hirsch Fund. So I want to mention again this incredible uh, philanthropist who was involved in, for example, uh, uh, sending Jews to colonize in Argentina and, and elsewhere in the New World. He establishes in 1888, takes three years to get its approval, uh, a fund to improve the lot of Galician Jewry through modern primary and vocational education geared especially towards artisan crafts and agriculture. At its height, the foundation ran as many as 50 schools throughout Galicia and Bukovina, specifically redressing the fault of the cheder system. So that means proper facilities, you know, air and light, things like that, even playgrounds sometimes. The curriculum is designed to give the children a basic elementary education in the local language, i.e. Polish, of sufficient caliber to guarantee state recognition. There's also the growing incorporation of sport and exercise. And these also had an impact. Many, many students went through the system, uh, and a lot of the memoirs talk about the, the impact of these. So this brings us to the end of our unit on the 19th century. Uh, when we pick up the story, we're going to be dealing with World War I and the end of Galicia as a legal province. It'll be part of the new Polish state.
uh, later after the Second World War, part of Ukraine mostly in Poland. Uh, but it lives on, as we'll talk about in future lectures. Galicia lives on in the emigrant communities. It lives on in the culture of Galicia. Uh, it lives on in notions of the Galicianer and so on. And we'll speak about that as well at the very end of the class. Galicianers and Galicia doesn't go away per se, but this will be, it, during World War I, the end of Galicia as a province. It, as a legal province, when we come back to Galicia after the First World War, it's going to be part of a new entity, the new Polish state. And we'll pick up that story uh, next time with the outbreak and course of the First World War. Thanks a lot.